You're either screaming hot, storming, or windy in a fire season, you The weather has just got me down a little bit. That's a clip from one of my favorite guilty pleasure reality shows alone. And it has a strange connection in so many ways with today's interview with Cosmic Keys podcaster Dan Shukas, who I, I have to apologize again because this episode has been hanging in my basket to get out for the longest time. But it's out now, and I really, really think it's an interesting conversation on so many levels. Here's a clip. When you shine a light into a dark room, it lights up the whole room. It's a weird time for kind of preaching these like spiritual love messages because so so many things are topsy turvy. But I I sort of think it's extremely individualistic, and you have to save yourself. You have to be accountable for yourself and know how powerful that is because these evil forces really can't handle it and they'll they'll go away the more people embrace love welcome to skeptica where we explore controversial science and spirituality with leading researchers thinkers and their critics i'm your host alex sakaris and today we welcome dan shukas of the cosmic keys podcast here to the skeptico lair <laughs> You know, Dan was nice enough to have me on his show, Cosmic Keys, a few weeks ago, and we had a really great time, had a really good conversation about some interesting stuff that, I don't know, I don't think it's talked about enough. So we both wanted to continue it, so we thought we'd bring the conversation over here. Dan, welcome. Thanks for joining me. Yeah, thanks for having me, Alex. It's an honor because... Uh... As I told you in our interview on Cosmic Keys, I've been listening to Skeptico for a while now, and I never thought I never thought you would want to talk to me about stuff. So thanks for having me. I'm honored. <laughs> I never know what I never know quite what to say when people say they're honored to talk to me, but that's cool. I'll go with it. I'll roll with it. So for for folks who don't know, you know, tell us who is Dan Shukas and tell us about Cosmic Keys, going through a couple iterations. Tell folks what you're doing over there these days. But first, who are you? Yeah, well, um, God, I don't know where to start. So I I grew up, well, we talked about this on my show as well. I grew up outside of Chicago, same area as you, Alex. We both went to the same high school. Um, and I started Cosmic Keys with a co-host, Scarlett Ravenswood, who's kind of in like the neo-pagan spiritual new age community. And I had been interested in these spiritual topics um, for my whole life. And when I met Scarlett, she kind of, because she was already out there in the public with her YouTube channel and her social media stuff, she was already talking about these topics openly. And at the time I was pretty nervous to put myself out there and speak about these things, but we kind of paired up with cosmic keys with me doing the astrology forecast for the week ahead and her doing a tarot reading for the week ahead. And we talked to a lot of, a lot of similar people that you talk to people that are in spiritual paranormal, kind of metaphysical communities. And um, we started it in Chicago and I ended up moving to Colorado and she ended up moving to Dallas. 2020 hit and I was running my mouth and trying to talk about the uh, controversial things happening this year. And then she walked away from the show. We're still and we still keep in touch. And it was a, you know, it was a, not there's no bad blood at all but now that i have the show to myself i have it a little bit more open ended where i want to talk about you know the conspiracy topics the spiritual topics all of the controversy of 2020 and also stick to the roots of you know um, consciousness spirituality astrology hermeticism um so yeah that's kind of where i'm at right now in this crazy year 
You know, I, I get that on one hand, and I get that you got to have a lane and you got to stay in your lane. I don't do that at all. I don't try and stay in any particular lane. But I, I always wonder, it, did, did you kind of see it that way? And do you see it that way now? Because it doesn't seem that way. It seems like you kind of go wherever wherever you want. Yeah, absolutely. Like if I, if I discover somebody that, that has something interesting to bring to the table, I definitely, you know, reach out and book them for an interview and don't necessarily think, Oh, do they fit the brand or that do they fit the subject matter? So it's, yeah, before it was very much like, you know, me and Scarlett kind of sticking with astrology and tarot and stuff under that umbrella and now I'm trying to just talk about current events more. And, but I, I, I do, I am really focused on the spiritual perspective. So if we can look at current events from a spiritual perspective, that's kind of what I'm shooting for. But yeah, I don't, it's pretty open ended for me. Anybody that's interesting enough to chat, I'm down to chat with. Yeah. And I think, you know, this is something we talked about on your show, but. I really kind of appreciated and really like the way you've kind of done that because we, we talked some of the pros and cons of the talking about current events and we can't even talk about them as current events, Dan. Cause I mean, one of the things that you brought to uh, focus last time was that things are happening at a rate whether you're into kind of current events, conspiracies, all that stuff, it's been so in your face this year that you really can't avoid it. And again, I thought you had just a great kind of perspective shifting thing when you talked about the long game, what I'm calling the long game. Mm -hmm. And you said, if we look at the stuff that's happening right now, and I'm talking about the, the pandemic and the, you know, you can't help but talk about, uh, you know, the election stealing kind of thing, no matter how you come down on that. I mean, it's unprecedented. Uh, y y if you look at that stuff and then what you did is said, well, what if we shifted that and looked at the longer game? And you even went so far as to say, look at my parents, you know, and what was their game? What was the game for them? You know, I was like JFK. And then you said, you know, what was the game changer for you? I was like 9-11. Mm -hmm. You know, another one I'd throw in there is the the global, uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, the global warming uh, kind of failed attempt, you know. Mm -hmm. So do you want to just kind of riff on that for a minute? That there is, if we do take a step back, there seems to be this longer game at play. Yeah, totally. I mean, when you study conspiracies in general i mean you could go back to ancient times if you really want wanted to um but i see it it's pretty clear that there are groups and institutions that that plan out social engineering they i mean if you look into like the uh the mockingbird cia influence on the media are really thinking about the long game and they are thinking about generations and stuff like that. And I, you know, in my, what you were saying with like my parents who are kind of like boomer aged and their parents who were of like the world war two generation. And then me as a, a millennial, you know, from my grandparents world and worldview to today and beyond, like there's been a lot of things that have changed in the culture. And I think the sixties, like, right. I think JFK was really that turning point, not only because the, the cultural revolution, like in, you know, the West of kind of like the hippie movements and all of that, but then like the cultural revolution in China and then the Vatican two pro project or whatever. I mean, I was raised Catholic and I, I have like a, a fondness for certain kind of mystical aspects of Catholicism and 
the Vatican II thing is huge because that really changed Catholicism into a more Protestant thing. And by the time it hits the millennials like me, like I, you know, I kind of liked my religion when I was a little kid, but then when I was, you know, around 9-11, around my teenage years, there's this real association between the Catholic church and pedophilia. So like, who's going to stick with that? So I feel like over the 20th century into the 21st century, there's just been constant social engineering projects straight up, like breaking things down. And when you, when you have that kind of alchemical perspective and knowing that the elites are familiar with occult ideas or, you know, into all of that, it really is kind of like an alchemical breakdown of society to rebuild it into what they want. And from what I'm looking at with like contact tracing and vaccine passports and um, the 5G internet of things, it seems like the, the, the great work that they're trying to build is more of like a feudal system where um, most of us are just peasants and there's, you know, a select few that are at the top. So yeah, the long game is really interesting. And it's, and I think 2020 was a year where we're, we're in a new phase of the long game. And when I look at people younger than me, like people that are like Gen Z or younger, like they're calling them like the, the alpha generation, like little kids right now. I can only imagine how they're being conditioned right now with masks and with all of these propaganda things, they don't know any better. And um, if we're, if we're going to try to take any control back from this like techno feudalism that they have ready to roll out, it's going to, I mean, we're going to have to deprogram a lot of this social engineering. So it's, it's kind of a dark thing to think about, but I think, that's why the spiritual is so important because if you literally um, are in touch with your inner world and in touch with your soul, and if you have a mindful, if you practice some kind of mindfulness practice, you can kind of step back and um, find inner peace in the middle of this whirlwind of, of chaos. Well, you kind of, kind of laid a lot out there. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to try and pull it apart because the long game, the big game, and the only game. That's how I break it down. Like, here's where I take the long game. I just connect the dots that you that you have. So, like, you look at today in the pandemic and you go, it, it, it's a conspiracy. If it, it, At its simplest level, it's a conspiracy that there's no medical scientific evidence behind any of these edicts, right? They're just... They're just now edicts, you know, that, and, and they're highly politicized. So if you're apolitical, like I am, you just step back and go, oh, okay, someone's running a game. That's a program. That's a project. Otherwise, it doesn't work that way. Otherwise, there's some kind of scientific basis for these things. There's kind of some uh, democratic basis for these things, and, and, and there isn't. So you go, okay, I get it. I've seen that before. and And you've seen it before, like... You can go to 9-11, like you said, okay, yeah, you know, the <laughs> we we have this event and the next day there's a thousand page Patriot Act bill on the desk of Congress. You go, that doesn't happen accidentally. There's a list of seven countries we're going to invade and we invade them all. That you just go, okay, I get it. That's a game. That's a program. I would also connect it, and this is the other one I want to throw on the table. I was reminded of uh, the interviews I did on global warming before I really caught on to it for what it was, which is another game, another project. I kind of looked at it from a science perspective and it pissed me off because it's like, you guys are not following the science. And I'll never forget, I talked to one guy <laughs> and, and you know, you wanted to go into talk about like MK Ultra programming, you know, like they always show the clip if you go on, the, like the Al Roker thing where he freezes, you know. Or people have other ones. And I don't know if that stuff's real or not. It, a lot of it seems very, very dicey. But I think there's a kernel of truth to it. 
as well in some ways. And I remember I, I interviewed uh, Daniel Pinchbeck, who has a really interesting background. So when you look at his parents and stuff like that and in the media business, which is always kind of a tip off. And he was back, this was a few years ago, when he was really pitching the uh, climate apocalypse stuff really, really hard and really getting in my face. And I guess he felt like I was kind of getting in his face too, although I thought I was being pretty gentle about it. <laughs> but then I brought up and I said, okay, but yeah, it's really about, uh, even if we believe what you're saying about global warming, then the main thing that we're focusing on from a real issue is population, overpopulation, right? I mean, you you go from However, bill, however many billion you think we have now, and you double it, and you got a huge problem. So you got to address that. It was really interesting. His response was like this, like an Al Roker kind of program. No, there isn't a problem with overpopulation. You could fit every person in the United States in the state of Texas. You could, and 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 that's what he said too. That's another like, like almost like a code phrase that these guys have. It's not a population problem. You could fit everybody in Texas. And then you just step back and you go, that is so ridiculously absurd. Why would an intelligent person be kind of even spinning that? Anyone says, says back, goes, we've got a, popul a world population problem. But that's been programmed into us that anyone who says that is somehow, you know, connected with eugenics and the rest of this. Well, I mean, we kind of know that's what's going on, that there's some shade of that going on with the pandemic stuff, but it's never made explicit. It's always kind of in the, in the background, you know, it's, it, it's, it's never made explicit. So, and, and I guess I'm using that as another, you know, game kind of thing. And then you wanted to put JFK in there and great. So <laughs> I'm reluctant to connect that the, with the way that you did and the way that some people do and look at these occulted symbols and look at how these guys like to use numerology and all the rest of that. I'm not saying that isn't true. I'm just saying that isn't necessary to look at this as a social engineering project. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's, it's useful to separate the two because if we look at the next category that I would have, which would be the big game, which is what's really behind that, that's where I'd break down that other stuff and want to bring in the occult stuff. I'd want to bring in the evil as we understand it in the extended consciousness realm, whatever that means, and whether you think it's satanic or whether you think it's Gnostic or whatever the hell you think it is. And, um, you know, so what do you think of that kind of division there? Do you think that that makes sense or is useful or just further complicates it? No, I think that is a good division. Like the long game, having more um, occult or evil satanic elements to it. And it gets me thinking that all of all of these kind of nefarious things that happen in the world with social engineering projects with these events you're talking about like i don't i don't necessarily think even the the top dogs that are working on these things are necessarily occultists or consciously trying to invoke evil i i think it's possible that these things are all invisible forces anyways, and they're just part of the human psyche. And they, in this sort of weird metaphysical, invisible way are always bringing us towards the long game, which you're talking about. Um, and it's, it's all really speculative, but it's, if you have discernment, you can kind of just see, you know, the people that are, that are creating these, these social engineering projects or these false flag events or these pandemics or whatever are motivated by things that are evil. But I don't know if that means 
See, how do we know that, though? See, and that's where I make the distinction between the long game and the big game. So to me, the long game is if you think this is recent, if you think this is just something that happened yesterday, it, it isn't, you know, and that's why I went to lengths to talk about. To me, I think he can, as, as you did, I mean, you were the guy who originally kind of sent me down this direction. There's a direct path between 9-11 and the pandemic. And I'd even say in between there, there's a stopping point with the failed attempt at uh, global warming. Sure. And, and yeah. you, might even, you might even point to the failed attempt at the Tic Tac, uh, you know, disclosure rollout kind of thing, whatever they were trying to do that. Both those things failed. And I, I haven't heard anyone really talk about that in an interesting way. But the 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 global warming thing, it just didn't work. It got blown up by climate gate, and then it got blown up by the weather. These guys didn't realize, and we think they're so freaking smart. I mean, they picked kind of a bad thing there when they picked the weather, because they really, ultimately, they couldn't control it. And people were like, it ain't warming up, you know, it ain't doing it. It's colder than hell here in Boston this year. What are you guys talking about? It just didn't pass the test. And then they, if you remember, they, they got more and more absurd. Well, the the it's getting colder. The water is just the deep down below the water is really, you know, I, these kind of just bizarre kind of things. So I see the, I see this line of this long game, but I'm not sure about the big game. So to say the big game is a cult, the big game is satanic, the big game is this Gnostic, good versus evil. Throughout history, it's really, when you take the longer lens of history, it's very difficult to tell, you know, the good guys from the bad guys without a scorebook, you know. Mm -hmm. Is Bill Gates going to look like a superhero a hundred years from now because he culled the planet by uh, 50% and, and saved the planet. That's not my opinion. If you ask me right now, but you know, someone, someone in the future could make that argument if it turns out that way. And you'd have to say, you know, that's it. You know, I was watching a, a, a really weird uh, kind of digression, but I was watching a, a World War II uh, documentary because my wife loves everything about Holocaust and it, interesting it. She's interested in it. She went over there and toured all the, you know, all the the death camps. And, and, and she has a very somber, you know, concern about a deep concern. It's not like she's a, you know, just a groupie for it. She's mm -hmm. has a deep feeling and a deep sensibility to it. But anyways, we're watching the documentary, and it's about how the British bugged, they had this uh, like prison encampment, this high-end Ritz-Carlton prison for Nazi uh, officers, very high-level officers, generals and stuff like that. So they brought them on and they kind of fattened them up and these guys spilled the beans. They didn't realize it, you know, but the whole thing was bugged. <laughs> it's a brownstoning thing. Yeah. Yeah. Jeffrey Epstein would be proud. So they were constantly bugging these guys throughout the thing. And they were just kind of made it very easy for them, very lax environment. And they started talking and they started giving up all this incredible information. And at this time they started giving up a bunch of information about uh, the death camps, information that was unknown, you know, and they're and they're admitting these war crimes. So at the end of the film, you're like, okay, what happens to these guys, right? Of course, they're put on trial. Of course, they're in Nuremberg, right? No, none of them were. The British government, who is primarily the one running the operation, decided that it would be too big of a give up to disclose their practices that they might want to use this in the future, or they might want to use this information. So therefore they would let it all just be buried in the annals of history. And it never would have been discovered if this one researcher didn't stumble upon it in some archives, which probably should have never been there if they would have had a, a better sense that they were there. But long way around the barn, 
who who are the good guys and who are the bad guys there? <laughs> yeah, that, that's definitely tricky because I mean, even thinking about World War II, I mean, how much of the CIA today was influenced by the the Project Paperclip, where all of those scientists were kind of divvied up and sent, you know, to the U.S. or to the USSR back then. And then the space race began and then MK Ultra began. And, you know, all of th- that type of science, that sick, twisted, manipulative type of science. You know, I learned about that in junior high when I learned about the Holocaust, when they were doing weird experiments in the concentration camps. And you just had the sense that these Nazi scientists were sick, twisted psychopaths. Well, we kind of that that's kind of the foundation of the post World War II America in a way with with everything that happened after that. So it's I mean it a lot of people have pointed this out, but Sidney Gottlieb, the guy who runs the MK Ultra program, is your classic sick, twisted scientist. And he, he happens to be Jewish. Not that that matters, although it does. It we can't help but say that it matters, given the weird historical context that we went exactly like you said and picked up where they left off with all these sick MK and German mind control projects. And uh, there's Sidney Gottlieb. The only other thing I always point out is, you know, in Sidney Gottlieb, I I I love this because it's like. A, such a skeptical thing. Sidney Gottlieb is in charge of the Stargate program too, you know, the mm-hmm. remote viewing program, which we all want to say, oh no, that's really cool. That's where we're, you know, fighting for freedom. You know, it's not, no, Sidney Gottlieb comes and says, yeah, let's dose him with LSD and see, see what happens. And, you, you know, we get uh, Russell Targan, Hal put off. So yeah, and we had to tell Sidney that wasn't a good idea and this and that. Yeah, but Sidney was your fucking boss, dude. Sydney was your boss and he was running all these other sick freaking programs. And exactly what you said, Dan, that's who we had become. And there's no evidence that that has changed. You know, I mean, that is who we are. Yeah. And it's, I, I remember, yeah. And now it's, it's, it gets me thinking there was some post from like a CIA woman on Twitter and they're kind of like putting themselves out there and like being like, Oh, the CIA is going to be inclusive or like anti-racist. So they can, they're like applying all the woke rhetoric to the freaking CIA. And um, yeah, it's, it's all of those things. And I, I was just kind of Googling Sidney uh, Gottlieb who you're talking about, but Again, even when I think about the generations, like the um, the hippie movement, there's a lot of CIA, a lot of CIA involvement in all of that. Obviously, the LSD thing, the Timothy Learys. And um, so it seems so much like these big social changes kind of just um, organically uh, burst forward. And it's like, oh, yeah, this it's time for us to evolve or change. But a lot of the times it seems like it's it's controlled by these deep state forces and i i really think you know the 60s is a huge turning point then you know the 70s and 80s and 90s are kind of like easing into those changes and then boom 911 new changing point like obama was a big changing point and now 2020 is going to be absolutely huge for like the big technocratic changing point and I don't even think we've seen um, half of what's going to really roll out in the next few years with like all of these uh, things that they've got ready, ready to roll out. Is Bill Gates a hero? Are, are, oh, are our no. kids and our grandkids going to be, you know, well, I but- swear to God, I swear to God, I was driving through La Jolla, California the other day and I saw a building size. It's only a two, three, it's like a three story building with a mural of Bill Gates on it. I'm like, hey, man, (laughs) there's a lot worse people in history that are, you know, posterized in that way. Well, okay, for Bill Gates in particular, I mean, I didn't know this about him until I think this year, but his father was uh, one of the founders of 
Planned Parenthood. So what? I mean, I want to make sure you get my point. So let's say all the bad stuff you know is true. And all the stuff, assume for a minute that all the crazy stuff that we hear about the vaccine is true. Mm -hmm. Does he still take, is he still the guy who saved the planet? Because here's my point, just being real skeptical for a minute. You don't control population on the planet, you're doomed. So whatever you think the population is now, 8 billion, 9 billion, it, 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 okay, you can double it. Okay, but I don't think you can double it, but you double it. You're at 16 billion. Can you double it again? You get to 32 billion? Because this, can this planet really support that many people? You know, China was building those ghost cities for the longest time because they're like, oh, what are we going to do with our population? We got to pull a bit up, build, put them someplace. So they build these huge cities and spend all this money with no one there just planning the growth. Well, now do they just kind of given up on that? Is someone just, is someone at a higher level in the big, big game saying, you know, it's just unsustainable and we got to figure out a way to do it that is the most humane, but eventually we got to get to less people. Don't get me wrong, folks. I'm not advocating that. I'm just saying until you put that out there, until you really uh, try and look at it from that perspective. You don't understand the kind of logic of that argument because we're, we're not treating the other part of that equation logically. We don't have any global plan to control the population because if we did, we would have done it 50 years ago and we wouldn't be in the mess that we're in. Yeah. I, I mean, it gets me thinking that there's, I, I agree that the you know, the global population is a really important issue. And if you have ex exponential population growth, you know, it kind of reaches a plateau and then plummets. And that's kind of nature. I think that's like a, a, a natural thing. Um, but when you have, you know, fam, I would call it families, like the Rockefellers or, you know, the, the, the Gates family is actually very similar to the Rockefeller family in that, you know, Bill Gates' father uh, was one of the original founders of Planned Parenthood, which was a, a eugenics program. It's like they, th that's out there. That's clear. And they were really trying to kind of achieve the same type of family goals as the Rockefellers. And with the Rockefellers, yeah, there's the Rockefeller Foundation. There's all these philanthropic uh, groups that these people are involved with and it's all PR also. So if you ask, is Bill Gates going to be remembered as a hero in 50 years or a hundred years? Well, he has so much freaking money to put towards his PR campaign that probably he will. I'm not saying it's going to be true, but will he be remembered by people as a hero? Yeah, because he's been putting God knows how much money towards that image crafting for his entire life. So it's just, and, and when you talk about the vaccines or the, the being an anti-vaxxer, anti-climate changer, like these things are sort of just things that people spit out. They, they have the, the lines ready. So, so, and they'll ostracize you like, Oh, are you an anti-vaxxer then? Oh, are you, a, you don't believe in science? And it's all baseline, really thoughtless reactions to certain things because those have been crafted by these social engineering forces, I guess. So I, and I'm noticing that more and more this year, like how many people in my life are just spitting out a, a reactionary response that was clearly crafted. And even like on my show, I one time was criticizing Bill Gates and I got some comments like Bill and Melinda Gates have done so much help, blah, 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 blah. I'm like, they bought that response from you. And people don't talk about when, you know, how they're banned from India or how all of these vaccines were just accidentally sterilizing people or how in the Bill Gates TED Talk video where he lists out how to, you know, control the global population and vaccine is one of the three bullet points. It's like, it's all out there. And 
I think the things that motivate these really powerful families, I think they have sort of like a God complex and they think they, it's their job to do, to do these big scale things to the planet when really like we should sort of let nature do its thing. And yeah, if, if our population gets out of control, nature might shake us back into a more sustainable level, but that doesn't involve mass deception of like <laughs> sterilizing people or euthanizing people by, you know, giving them some vaccine or some environmental factor. Well, he, he, here's, here's, I guess where I kind of pull the conversation back to, you know, long game, big game, only game. So to me, the long game is just saying, Hey, these things have been going on for a long time. If you want to go back even further, like you were doing, Go back to Christianity. Go back to Constantine is always my go-to on that, you know, because people get caught up with Jesus in the Bible. Just go right to 400 or 350, whatever it is, Constantine. Yeah, I think it's 315. Create serfdom, right? He gives you this religion, which is just a, an exact copy of the prior Roman religion, but he dresses it up. He calls it Christianity. And he says, okay, now here's the good news. Everything's going to be okay after this life. Ah, here's the bad news. I kind of own you right now. You can't, you will do the job that I say. You will have no property. You will have nothing. You are just a little tool for the state. 315, 350, here, 315, 1700 years ago. Total, uh, you know, game, total game game. So the social engineering game, and we can go countless examples over and over and over again, but that's different than the big game because the big game is evil. The big game is the occult game. The big game is the hidden game, the satanic game, because they're playing it at a different level because you only get so much you can only have so much money, so much power. You know, it's like the, the one of my favorite quotes, you know, what do men of power want? More power. If that's how you've built, if that's how you've constructed your consciousness, then that's what you want and you'll go anywhere to get it. So why wouldn't you extend into that other realm if it promised you whatever, power, live forever, uh, connection with entities that can do all this kind of stuff, that's where you'd go. And so let's talk about the big game. And then just so people know where I'm coming from, ultimately to me, the only game, the only game is a totally different game. It's the game of, <laughs> it's the game of love. It's the game of forgiveness. It's the game of, I don't cut off my thumb to spite my fingers. I don't battle people. I don't try and beat people. I just realize that we're all headed towards the same thing. You know, we're all doing the same thing. There's only the lightness. The darkness is just there to, to, to provide a relief, to provide a, a contrast for the game. So there, I've, I've kind of laid out my whole thing. Let's see what you think. Well, yeah, the, uh, it gets me thinking a lot about, you know, what this world is. And on your show, you talk about NDEs and stuff with evil being present here, down here in this world. Um, and then just with the knowledge that, yeah, love and forgiveness and peace and, you know, spiritual bliss is the real game. But yeah, I think evil is allowed to be present here where we are in this in this realm and in, in the extended consciousness aspect of life on earth there are definitely entities and evil forces and chaotic forces but if you think of it like i i agree that at our core us humans with our us ensouled humans you know that stuff really at the end of the day can't take away what we have on the inside. They can't really destroy our souls or our goodness, or our connection to the divine. But I, I sort of think that like this, this world is a big 
game and the the evil forces are here they're allowed to be here because they do lead to evolution and growth and experience and all of that and i don't th- and even when the in the christian terminology they they just talk about satan as like the prince of this world because like this world needs those evil forces for us souls to come here and do do what we've got to do and i i think um having no discernment or having the idea that evil doesn't exist can just um make your time here even more miserable or add consequences to you know what you bring with you after death but um i i i i i like your focus on acknowledging evil and talking about evil and not denying evil. But I think from a spiritual perspective, you know, it's, uh, it's way less powerful than like the, the positive love force that we all are really made of, I guess. I don't know. You know, I I agree. And and the problem with that is it, it doesn't have the power for people. I think they immediately want to turn away because it doesn't. It doesn't give the juice. It doesn't give the jolt. It doesn't give the satanic ritual abuse jolt. Yeah, I'm with you. And um, when you're th- when you're thinking about love and uh, um, the way things work in this world, I mean, lately, uh, like I, I think not only do you need to like embrace love and forgiveness, but you just need to be aware of little negative thoughts and little resentful thoughts and everything and just stop yourself and just change the way you're thinking, change your vibration. And then more like, it's kind of like that law of attraction thing. Like you reap what you sow, you attract to your, your vibration matches um, what's coming towards you. So if you're sitting around, hateful and and this is some this is a problem with me i have a problem of not forgiving people or not trusting people or holding grudges against people and who's losing at the end of the day for being like that nobody but me so um when you talk about you know the only thing that's going to take us out of this hell is the force of love and compassion and forgiveness yeah because it has a it has a domino effect and it's, it's more, it's like, you know, when you shine a light into a dark room, it lights up the whole room without that one source of light. It's still pitch black. And I think it's easier than we think to, to try to do better and to try to, um, get rid of these evil forces that are everywhere. But I, I see it as a very individualistic journey because if you don't look at yourself and sort of think who am i who am i hating right now who am i holding a grudge against who am i resentful towards um if you don't stop and observe that then it's going to be going on in the background non-stop and it's 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 a weird time for kind of preaching these like spiritual love messages because so so many things are topsy-turvy but i I sort of think it's extremely individualistic and you have to save yourself. You have to be accountable for yourself and know how powerful that is because these evil forces really um, can't handle it and they'll, they'll go away. The more people embrace love. There's so many really interesting little things you said there that I think are so profound. I mean, one, you have to save yourself. I love that because I think that's so true. And I also agree with you that it is a matter of being mindful of the little things. At the same time, I also, I don't know if I want to, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I kind of heard you say that, you know, this stuff isn't really that hard in a way, you know, it's just really not, you know, it's uh, like one of my teachers, Mickey Singer says, it's like you're drowning in six inches of water, you know, just lift your head up, you know, it's don't, don't, 
do that anymore. I just interviewed a guy. I really, really love this guy. His name is Tim Grimes. And he wrote a book, The Joy of Not Thinking. And I found his book just going through Kindle. And it was uh, in the, it was, you know, Kindle Unlimited. I'm like, wow, that sounds interesting. The guy is phenomenal. I love this guy. And the title says it all in terms of what we're talking about. It's like, you don't have to fucking think about everything. Mm -hmm. You don't have to take everything so fucking seriously. You're not at the center of the universe. You're not at the center of your world. You're not even at the center of your fucking county. You know, <laughs> it's not that what whatever is going to happen, you have, you know, you you don't worry so freaking much about it. And the other thing is just be 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 playful. Have fun with yourself, with life, you know? The joy of not thinking, how freeing it is to give this. We don't have to solve all these problems. These are other people's problems for the most part that we're taking on. Yeah, it's uh, it's just lately, especially for me, like it's it's definitely and you have a yoga background. I just think, you know, when you when if you put the the moralistic like Christian perspective of like, you know, love, love thy neighbor as thyself or whatever. Um, and all the really basic tenets of Christianity, which are pretty straightforward and true in my opinion, the bait, like I'm not talking about the dogma or the institutions or anything, but the basics of Christianity are, are true. But I notice like when I'm, if, if I don't embrace some kind of, let's say Eastern, practice i can't do that very effectively because if you're not mindful if you're not centered and introspective how are you you're not going to be aware of when you're just pissed off and resentful and um spewing out negative things all the time do you really believe that see i don't think you believe that because i think what you said before contradicts that which is that it, it's it's pretty easy. You just got to catch yourself. It's easy when you're when you're spiraling down that path. We all see it in ourselves. We just like we're just stuck in that groove, and we're like, "Fuck, this just feels more comfortable right now to spew this shit." Or we've been told that, "Hey, it's a good idea to get it off your chest or to process it and stuff like that." I go back to I'll, I'll rewind on you, Dan. What you said before, which is just no. You don't have to. You you find yourself thinking those thoughts. You go. No, think, uh, either stop thinking, like my buddy Tim says, or just understand that there's a completely other perspective on, you know, whatever hate you're having, you know, about some other person. Right, right. I'm just saying, um, I was just trying to bridge the gap between, you know, being good and being forgiving and loving and being self-aware about it and having a mindfulness practice definitely gets you out of that autopilot mode because if you're if you're not stopping and observing your thoughts which is what you do in mindfulness meditation you i don't know i mean you might not be aware of of what you, of how you're acting because you're just impulsively um reacting to everything around you and you're not thinking oh i have the choice to stop thinking about this and just hit mute for a second. And if you hit mute, all of a sudden that little uh, burst can kind of dissolve and you're at square one again. I don't know. That's just what I've been recently kind of doing with the stresses of this year, the stresses of a day job and like just realizing the little things are really dragging me down. Just like the, you know, getting getting pissed at somebody at work or getting pissed at someone in your family for a little thing. And then just letting that grow and grow. I think the mind, like being mindful as much as possible and knowing that you can just hit stop, like you're saying, stop thinking for a second and hit reset, I think is serving me lately at least. And that's awesome. So we're just shooting ideas back and forth. Oh yeah. Yeah. So two things that, that I, these are like subtle little things, but this is like the most important fun stuff to talk about. I see it kind of differently and it doesn't mean that I haven't tried exactly what you're talking about, but where I'm at now, 
is one, you know, like I told you, Tim Grimes, the joy of not thinking is that that really is an option. And I think we're so conditioned to thinking that that isn't an option other than in some super tricky spiritual Eastern way of not thinking, of being mindful, of being centered. And Tim's saying, fuck that shit. Just stop thinking. You don't, you don't have to think. And then when you say that, that to somebody, you'll notice that they'll go like, well, I, I can't do that. I mean, what would happen? Say, okay, stop thinking for the next 30 seconds. How about that? Would that totally fuck up your life? Would your life totally fall apart if you stopped fucking thinking for the next 30 seconds? Give it a try. Stop thinking. Stop thinking you have to know. Stop thinking you have to solve. Stop thinking you have to fix. Just stop thinking. Be a bum daydream, you know, watch your feet as you walk, you know, do whatever. It doesn't matter. It's not like you have to substitute it with something great or something magnificent or something epic. Just fuck it. Be a bum for 30 seconds and stop thinking and taking it seriously. And the other guy I'd point to is my fucking man, Wim Hof, who says the same thing. Fuck it. I go in the, the I think I told you that. I mean, I built it. I, I believe in Wim so much. I built a fucking ice bath in my backyard and it's a oh, freezer nice. filled with water and ice. And it's like big chunks of ice. You go in the ice. You're not, it's magnificent. It's brutal and you don't want to do it, but it's magnificent. You are not thinking about stupid fucking shit. And what does Wim say? He says three things. Be happy, be strong and be healthy. You know, you don't have to, you can choose to be happy. All this shit that's going on, the vaccines are going to, they might do all the rest. Fuck it. I don't care. I choose to be happy. And, and if you, you know, work at managing the, the biology that you have, get good sun, get good exercise, hop in that ice bath, you're much more likely that the, the chemicals in your brain are working better and you're just are naturally happier. But again, the programming we have is that that's not a good idea. No, you couldn't, you couldn't be happy, not with everything that's going on. You couldn't possibly be happy. Big game, long game, big game, only game, only game, be happy. That's all there is. I'm totally with you. And, um, it gets me thinking too, because, uh, I just moved this year and yeah, I'm pretty damn happy this year. Like I am keeping this podcast going. I'm playing in a band. I get to snowboard cause I live in a ski town and I, you know, a part of me is sort of like, man, I'm so happy. Like I should be a little bit guilty. I should feel a little guilty, right? About right, this. right. <laughs> but it's just like, if you're cultivating your own happiness in, in sort of a self-centered way, it has effects on the people in your life. And you're actually doing good work by just focusing on yourself so that you're, you are happy and you're not carrying around resentment and all of this stuff. And, and when you're saying, you know, with you, when you're talking about Wim Hof, when you're talking about the, um, the guy that's saying, stop thinking or don't think, I'm, I'm with you 100%. I think it's just important to think about that as a practice. Like, you can't just, I, I think if you want to actually stop thinking, you have to work at it rather than just do it on command. Okay, but just, just to be clear, Tim Grimes is saying the exact opposite of that. He's saying, okay. get that out of your head. I, I agree with what what he's saying, I guess. I'm, I've never read his work or anything, but... I like the idea that, yeah, it's not this like complicated practice. Yeah. Just stop thinking, just make it easy. Don't overthink it. Don't think. I think that's great too. But in my experience of trying to, do, do you think, do you think when you snowboard? Oh no, <laughs> that's what I, that's why I do it. But yeah, the, the, like the flow state that you get into, whether it's, you know, making art or snowboarding or any of that, that's, that's amazing. But even, I'm just saying that you have to at least put a little bit of work into, like, say, if you just want to not think and snowboarding is your way of doing that, well, you at least have to like, figure out how to snowboard as much as possible, which can be, I, I don't know. I'm just saying it takes a little bit of work to do. I, I still consider that a practice to, to not think. And I think practice, you get better at it with time. And I don't, 
I don't necessarily agree that if you just say, not, don't think now and it, it'll take no work, just do it now, you'll it, instant success. I, I'm more of like of the opinion that it does take work in the long run, but it, it is a great um, goal and it's a great sentiment for sure. So uh, we've been at this for a little while. Tell folks what's going on at Cosmic Keys, who you got coming up to, who you're talking to, where you where you're planning on going. Well, um, I've got a lot of interviews on deck at the moment, um, and I've been I'm trying to bring it kind of more back. I, I'm really interested in talking about astrology. Um, we didn't really talk about astrology in this interview, but it's a thing that I am actually pretty skeptical of at the end of the day. But I, what I like about astrology is just the act of, of observing time. It, it, you know, if you make predictions or if you make interpretations, that's one thing. But if you just simply observe the movement, I think that's um, the most fulfilling thing about astrology. So I'm going to be talking to people about the astrology of 2021 and kind of what we're, we might expect there. And I'm definitely just, you know, trying to keep it going and keep talking to people that I find interesting. I'm discovering a lot of new podcasts out there as well. And um, just kind of, you know, even talking with you, talking with all the other podcasters that I speak with, I love the networking aspect of it and it's, ex it's extremely fun to, you know, schedule an hour interview and just have a real conversation once a week versus all the mundane conversations that we usually have with people, with everyday people. So I'm just, you know, following my bliss and bringing, um, whatever, just, I'm open to whatever comes with the future of the show, but, uh, yeah, and I, th I think I'm going to be changing the Patreon format, so that's going to be coming up later on. But uh, yeah, that's about all I can think of with Cosmic Keys. Well, cool. I'm a fan. I'm going to continue to listen. And uh, this has been a great chat. Kind of went a bunch of different places. We didn't really plan it, but that's okay. Oh, yeah, that's perfectly fine. I had a great time chatting here. And um I've really been enjoying your show too. And I've, uh, I, I like that you have me a podcaster on and I, I've like, I've actually subscribed to a handful of the, the podcasters you recently had on and have been really enjoying those shows too. So maybe, uh, someone listening will catch my show and I, I just like discovering new voices and you've been doing that more recently, it seems like. Yeah. And I'm going to continue to do it because I can't, could not agree with you more about just having meaningful conversations, you know, on a regular basis. And I think podcasters, and like I told you when we first talked, I mean, I, I was turned on to what you're doing. I was like, wow, this is great. These are great conversations that Dan's having. I really want to join in. So uh, it's a cool process. Yeah, well, uh, like I told you, I've been listening to Skeptico since probably like 2014 or 15 or something. And you're totally up there with, with you know, I mean, my sh I, I just am like doing my show the way I think podcasts should sound. And your show, the, the conversation style you have is an influence on me. Same with a lot of other, a lot of others, but uh, we're all kind of we're, it's all kind of like a big network and we're all kind of just helping each other out and bouncing ideas and inspiring things with each other. So it's all good. Absolutely. It's all good. Okay. Dan, Cosmic Keys, check it out. It's great having you. Yeah. Thanks again, Alex. It was really fun. Thanks again to Dan for joining me today on Skeptico. Do check out his show, Cosmic Keys. I promise you won't be disappointed. The one question I tee up from this episode would be, do 
do you think we what do you think of the long game big game only game idea that we're kicking around here are a lot of our frustrations and are a lot of our frustrations are a lot of our frustrations and worries are a lot of our frustrations and worries due to the fact that we focus too much on the now game and not enough on the big game let me know your thoughts love for you to join me over on the skeptical forum but you don't have to do that if you don't want to you can just continue to listen to the show i have some new ones coming up real soon stay with me for all of that until next time take care and bye for now show with just an extraordinary with just a great guest who i really